Hello and welcome to episode 99 of the Synergen Leadership Podcast. For those of you who are listening for the very first time, my name is Julian Carl and I'm the CEO and the co-founder of Synergen Group. I'm passionate about all things leadership and management, so passionate in fact that I decided to start a podcast about it. Here we are, season two, and my purpose for the podcast continues to be the same, to raise the standard of leadership. In today's show, I speak with Nancy Youssef, who is the founder of Classic Mentoring and Coaching. Nancy has disrupted old models of mentoring, new to industry mortgage brokers, and is playing a crucial role in nurturing the best of the industry's next generation. As a passionate mortgage broker and educator of new talent, she brings her love of service, teaching, learning, and her commitment to the highest professional standards together to make a difference in the lives of her clients and the careers of her mentees. With a personal belief in practicing what she preaches, her ability to dig deep in business and in life to align her values with a classic branded business has seen Nancy grow into a unique position of professional leadership in the mortgage and business community. Nancy has been recognized by winning the MFAA Excellence Awards for the Best Social and Community Champion in 2016-17 as well as the Advisor Magazine 2017 Better Business Award for Best Social Responsibility Program. Then we start the interview by looking back at when Nancy first started her own business. We speak about the lessons she has learned as a leader and how she has developed into the leader she is today. We also take some time to talk briefly about why she decided to write her book, Fear, Money, Purpose. And we finish the interview by talking about the importance of sharing information and being transparent with the team. So keep listening. As always, really like to hear your thoughts about the interview with Nancy Youssef, founder of Classic Mentoring and Coaching. Happy listening. Welcome to the Synergen Leadership Podcast with Julian Carl. Julian returns in 2019 with weekly conversations with leaders and authors from Australia and around the world, giving you the opportunity to share in their journey and learn from their expertise and knowledge. Julian also shares some of the tools and techniques he uses as a leader, mentor and facilitator, helping you to build your leadership capability and improve your confidence as a leader. Welcome, Nancy, to the the Synergen Leadership Podcast. Really appreciate you taking the time to be a part of it. So that the listeners have a little bit of context, could you share a little bit about uh, you and what you do? Thank you, Julian. I'm really excited to be on the podcast with you today. Um, I uh, do a few different things. Most recently, um, so I work in financial services. I've got a business uh, by the name of Classic Finance, which I founded um, in the early 2000s. um, And that business is predominantly a finance broking business, providing uh, lending options and credit to people looking at getting into the property market. Um, Following on from that, I then founded a second company back in um, 2012 uh, around um, mentoring and education as I'm it's, that's really my passion and um, looking at that business uh, was was really finding a gap in the um, in the financial services space particularly around finance broking for new to industry entrants that were coming in um, and needing support um, and so I've run that business simultaneously um, with the finance business um, for the last um, over almost a decade um, recently, I wrote my first book, Fear Money Purpose, and on the back end of that, I've also been doing a fair bit of um, keynote speaking um, and, uh, yeah, amazing things like being on this podcast. So, yeah. <laughs> so, what is it that uh, attracted you to financial services? Um, probably my own journey, to be honest with you. I um, had no idea about finance. I was never really a, um, a math enthusiast at school or anything like that um, and having worked in um, in various roles before finance uh, particularly in, in, in marketing and, and sales um, and in operational roles I sort of stumbled into financial services when I engaged the services of a financial planner in my wee mid-twenties um, when I sort of thought I better be sensible with my money and look at how I can invest in my own property um, and at the time, I'd already uh, bought a first investment property and realized after a meeting with a financial planner that um, it wasn't structured correctly and um, the, the loan that I'd sought at the time and that I really had no idea about what to do next. And, you know, finance is such a maze and, you know, there were so many options that I was quite confused. And so I went on this uh, journey of getting good advice and education. Um, and once I started on that journey, um, I met a bank manager who then offered me a job 
and the rest is history. I sort of um, sort of jumped into banking, um, did a couple of years in that before I realised that I was very passionate about helping people like me who had no idea around the finance maze. Um, and so that was the reason that Classic Finance was born, really to help uh, eliminate a lot of the confusion and, and help um, people looking for loans um, to have access to those loans um, in plain English, as I called it back then. So that was the main driver. So I'm always curious about what it is which prompts people to leave the security of a, of a job and uh, jump into being their own business owner and, and everything that's attached to that because it is quite a scary uh, thing to do when you first do it. Was there, was there, was there a moment? Was there a catalyst? Mm. Was there something which made you say, no, nah, I'm going to take the plunge? Um, <laughs> quite vulnerably and quite authentically, I think I was just too young to know any better. I just jumped in and I think I didn't really give it a lot of thought and I, I very openly um, share that in my book. I, I, it was one of those things where I knew from a young age, I always had this ambition and, and growing up in a family that were all self-employed, I always had this ambition that I'd own my own business um, before I was 40. Um, and being impatient um, as I was and, and I think uh, really having a passion for travel, I wanted to be able to have the flexibility to travel as often as I could. Um, and, you know, by starting a business, I knew that I could, you know, have flexibility as well as, um, you know, work as hard as I really wanted to, but knowing that I was working hard for my own business and not for somebody else. Um Little did I know at that time that, you know, you've actually got to start making money before you can think about traveling and having the flexibility to rush off and do the things that you want to do. But um, certainly it was probably a little bit of uh, a little bit of being naive, actually, that I jumped in. Um, but at the same time, it was a determination and a passion to want to be my own boss um, that really helped get me through those first few years. Because I think it's always interesting to to consider what leadership looks like when you're running your own business. Cause I do think it's, it's different to when you're a leader in a large organization. So I'd like to take you back to, to, to where it was that you found yourself really needing to exercise some leadership. First time you need to exercise some leadership skills within your own business. Yeah. And I think um, when I first jumped in, I played it safe. Um, and I, you know, when, when you sort of spoke in the previous question a little bit about leaving the security of a corporate job and, um, you know, the regular paycheck, that was certainly a massive um, fear. And so at the time I managed to, um, you know, raise some capital um, to have aside 12 months worth of expenses cover so that if I wasn't making enough money, I would have some money to fall back on. But at the same time, in that first um, couple of years, I also took on a couple of, well, I took on a contracting role around education, uh, which meant that I would um, contract out my, um, contract out tr training and uh, receive a small retainer each month as well. So that kind of safeguarded a little bit of the fear around letting go of that pay packet. And for the first um, nine or probably for the first nine years, I reluctantly, I sort of just outsourced a lot of things in the business. Um, not, not everything. There was probably more I could outsource, but I didn't really want to hire anybody um, just for fear of, you know, having to commit to a, paying someone else's salary or um, for fear of um, not wanting to, uh, you know, grow the expenses of the business or, 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 you know, putting somebody on that may be a bad hire. But after being in business for almost a decade, I knew that I had to take the leap. If I didn't, there was no way that the business would grow. And so it was at that point where I hired my first recruit. And um, that was when I really had to start learning about, you know, being able to lead the business. Um, and I think the biggest lesson at that time or the biggest thing that I had to do was identify what I was passionate about in the business, what I was good at. And then delegating um, to my first employee the things that n weren't necessarily great use of my time or weren't energizing um, me in what I was doing or adding value to the business um, overall. Okay. And so that, that must have been a, an interesting time when you had your, 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 your first team member. What were sort of your biggest learnings from, from a leadership perspective? 
Um, look, the biggest learnings, and I think being a leader, you don't sort of wake up one day and, um, I mean, you may demonstrate leadership capability. And I think if you're, if you're strong and you've, you've got the, um, you know, the, the adaptability and the resilience and the empathy and a lot of things that leaders do need to demonstrate, um, they're sort of the core things that you need to have. But certainly working with different people, um, you develop that skill over a period of time. And so I don't think I, woke up at that time and thought, yep, today I'm a leader and I'm, I'm off I'm going to go. But one of the biggest learnings that I, I did have at that time was um, how to not only recognize my own strengths, but also recognize um, the strengths of, of somebody else. And really, I think the biggest thing was to be able to listen, um, you know, to uh, have strong communication and understand that if, you know, things weren't going the right way, what was the main um, reason that that was. But I also recognise the importance of, um, you know, checking in and, you know, having ongoing conversations around the vision. I think when you are able to impart what your vision is in your business, um, too often we just assume or I found that, in you know, over the years you kind of sometimes assume that your team or your staff know what you're trying to achieve, but sometimes they actually don't. And so the importance of being able to share that vision, and I think a good leader that can share their vision and also get their team energized and on board and what I call buy-in into that vision um, will certainly help a business grow a lot faster um, and a lot healthier um, by having people on board with what you're trying to achieve overall for not just the business, but you also as, a, as, a, as, a, as an owner of that business. Yeah, I think it's a really interesting point what you say about um, the, the, the the vision and making sure that people in your team understand it. Was there a was there an event, a, a moment when you realised that the uh, person that uh, you were leading they 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 weren't aware of the vision? Um, I think certainly in the first, um, I think certainly in the first twelve months, it was very much a reactive style leadership. It was kind of like, you've come in, I'm really strapped for time. I've got so much that I want to do in terms of processes in the business, and it was just very much hands on. Let's go, go, go. But over the time um, that the business started to grow, and we needed to look at hiring more people. That was where I recognized um, the importance of having a clear vision myself because what my vision was at the time that I hired one person certainly had then started to change a little as the business grew and as, um, well, as both businesses started to grow really, but also personally what I was trying to get out of what I was doing. And I think, you know, it's, it's important. I mean, that's why I say sometimes I know people sort of think about a 10-year vision or a seven-year vision. I find that just way too far because things do change and things change so rapidly. And in my own experience, I found that, you know, what I thought I wanted to achieve in, in 2010 or 2011 was quite different to what I wanted to achieve when I hit sort of 2014, 2015. And that's where, you know, being able to be clear about your own vision before you can actually impart that to your team is very important. So I'm always curious about what, uh, the views that people have on on leadership. So, what do you think is the biggest myth about leadership that you've come across in your journey? Um, look, I think that it's not so much a myth, but I think the main difference that I've seen um, in my own journey has been switching my mindset from being a manager in my business to an actual leader in my business. And I think as a manager, you sort of have, you know, your, your tasks and your to-do list and what needs to be achieved. And, and, you know, these are the operational things that we've, we've got to get through. Um, and so there's a strong focus on getting through the work um, and making sure it's all done at an optimum level. And that's sort of managing the business. Whereas um, in a leadership role, you um want to, again, as I said, the, the, the importance of vision is so important and being able to share that is so important. Um, and I think it's also about recognising not just your own strengths, um, but also the strength of your team. And I think one thing that we've invested um, in, in my team has been strength training and being able to um, look at the different types of um, uh, strengths that each of our team have got and then uh, helping 
create their roles or really fine tune their roles around their natural abilities because when people tend to work in their natural have you know in their natural ability or, or to what they gravitate better to we have a lot um, we have better results and overall better performance and a happier and a happier team mm. and do you think that's a common common approach with leaders that they deliberately try to focus people's roles as much as possible around their strengths not always. I mean, I've certainly worked in roles where that hasn't been the case. Um, and I also, um, you know, just from working with a lot of, you know, small businesses, I think um, I've seen that over the years that, you know, no, I mean, it just depends on how rigid or flexible or, or I guess invested um, a leader is in their team. I mean, people talk about, you know, yes, we're here to invest in our teams and, and we want to do this and we want to do that. From my own observations, I've seen um, both sides of the coin. I've seen the organisations that do um, look at it and that's what prompted me to look at that and explore that further for my own team because it just seemed to make sense to me that if, you know, your team rock up to work every day and they are working uh, to their natural abilities and their strengths and it doesn't feel like it's difficult I sort of say it's not like trying to squeeze a circle into a square and um, you find that when people are working to their natural ability they're a lot happier they're more productive they're um, you know not they're, they're more energized about what they're doing and I know that even from myself if I've got to do things that I don't naturally enjoy or I'm not naturally good at then I find it's a struggle and I'll tend to procrastinate and there's no difference with the team um, feeling the same so that then prompted me to go in and, and look at, you know, ways that we can develop the team around the strengths. And it's certainly been a process. But there are organisations, and I think sometimes the larger an organisation gets, the more difficult, I guess, it is to be able to do that because um, you've then got so many different, you know, um, divisions and line managers and reporting chains and all the rest of it. Um, in a small business, I think you've got a little bit more flexibility to um, to, to, to be able to create and, and mould that a little bit more. Mm. How would you describe yourself as a leader? Um, that's a tough question. <laughs> I think um, I, I, I find that I... One thing I know is that having worked in various roles um, before starting my own business, when I started to employ people, I wanted them to always feel that um, they enjoyed coming into work. And I try and be as empathetic as possible um, to my team. I try and provide a lot of flexibility. But I also don't like the hierarchy of, you know, I'm up here and you guys are all here. I sort of, if, if we've got a problem, you know, we're all in. Um, if we're short staffed, I jump into the trenches and I'm there helping out. Um, so I, I, I sort of find that, um, and I think being a little bit vulnerable also is, has been, has worked really well for me in that, you know, being personable, vulnerable and authentic with the team is really, really important. Um, and so, I find that um, my own leadership style is not one of, um, you know, I guess it's not too rigid. I'm, I'm quite fluid and, and agile and flexible and I, I tend to adapt, but I think that comes also from the role that I did for a long time in finance in that you need to, you know, be a good listener, be empathetic and adapt to different um, types of people that you deal with. So I, I think of myself as pretty strong, um, a little bit um, courageous sometimes. The team says a bit fearless, but I think that's a bit of a cliche. Um, but certainly um, there will be things that I get really excited by, and I think that's the entrepreneur in me where, you know, there's ideas and I sort of come in and I have the ability to actually build excitement and, um, and, and attain that buy-in I spoke about earlier from, from my team to deliver on a vision. And I think because of the nature of the work that uh, we do at Synergen, I'm always curious about uh, are there any particular methodologies, frameworks, models, tools that uh, leaders use on a day-to-day -day basis? Are there any that uh, really resonate with you? Yes. So the two things that I've invested in over the years, which I call, you know, and I strongly believe were game changers for my business um, to help the business overall um, from a structural perspective, but also from helping each individual team member. And the two things 
two programs we invested in. One was um, the EOS um, platform, for um, which is the entrepreneur's operating system, um, which we implemented into the business. That really involved us sitting down. And again, I'm, you know, I run a very small team. We, we have a mix of, of staff and contractors. But at that time, um, when we implemented the EOS um, operating system, it involved a few of us um, off-site for a couple of days, unpacking and really defining our vision, values, um, creating, you know, our, our, you know, sort of our core strategy and our focus for, you know, the next 12, 24 and 36 months, um, as well as building out sort of um, a vision for the business. And by having the rest of, you know, sort of key people that were doing key things in the team, uh, you know, on board with that meeting was really, really um, beneficial. And creating that strategy for those couple of days then gave us the foundation to implement the other tools as part of that operating system. Um, So that was one that I found um, was great for our business. The second thing that we now um, do for every person that comes in uh, into the business is getting them to do the Clifton Strengths. I'm not sure if you're familiar. You, you may be. Um, it's the top it's sort of. It's a. We invest in it in that um, it provides us with the top. There's usually 34 strengths that um, it sort of creates a report around. There's a survey, um, a questionnaire that each staff member completes, and then from that we identify their top five strengths, which um, then helps. Um, us in terms of communication, in terms of the role that we're creating for the for the person, and um, it also helps us with, um, I guess, having a bit more cohesiveness around the team. So, in terms of the, the the strengths assessment that you get people to go through, I'm curious about how mm-hmm. they respond when you ask them to do that. Um, okay, so recently we had. Um, a, a new sort of contractor starting with us and when I had to um, explain it to him he was a little bit um, confused because he'd never done anything like it before and sort of asked the normal questions like why do we need to do this um, you know is it sort of like analyzing my personality kind of thing or is this like disc and um, you know we sort of said look it's it's really um, a, around you know the kind of culture that we create here um, it really helps us and it helps me to be a better leader for you um, when I understand your strengths and ensuring that the role that um, you're doing um, is going to be a role that you're actually feeling inspired and, um, you know, something that you really gravitate to. Um, but it wasn't just myself. I think the fact that the team have seen the benefits of having um, these assessments done and what it's done for us as a team and what it's doing for us every quarter when we sit down and we reflect and we review and we talk about, you know, our challenges. Um, We also have, you know, discussed our strengths and how we've used our strengths on a weekly basis to, you know, um, overcome certain issues, whether they're client issues or whether they're operational issues. I mean, every week we talk about how we've been able to use and navigate with our strengths certain situations. Um, what was really pleasing to see is that I didn't even have to convince um, this person because the team were also there sort of really um, endorsing um, how important this is and how much it changed their role and how much it really helped them. And so just from the enthusiasm and the excitement that he could hear with with them meant that he was a lot more convinced than it having just come from me. So what, what do you think your biggest challenge is at the moment, Nancy, from a leadership perspective? Time. <laughs> I think it's... Um, Time is, is one of those things that it's it's such a precious commodity and something that we seem to keep having less and less of. And I'm very I'm a big stickler for time management, so I try and stick to, and we all work to it in my business. Um, it's it's an ideal week, and um, it's not always so ideal, but um, we always say that with with a plan, at least um, we're fifty percent of the way there than not having a plan at all. Um, so I think. Definitely time is, is, is one of those things, especially as, as, you know, business grows and things evolve and, you know, this particular year as well, I've, I've had a lot more to do outside of the business. Um, I think the biggest thing also is, is just staying, um, you know, 
on track with what we're trying to achieve, it can be very easy to jump at new opportunities that come in all the time and it can be very easy to lose focus or we're still trying to have split focus working across, you know, so many different things at the same time. Um, and so that that is a challenge, especially for an entrepreneur, because, you know, there's always a new and exciting, shiny thing that comes up and you think, yes, I'm going to do that. And then realize that, well, when, in what spare time have I got to actually do that? Mm. And so, yeah, I think um, keeping, um, finding more time or being better managed with time and certainly focus are the two challenges um, that um, that sometimes I personally face. I'm always interested when I talk to leaders about what their leadership passion is. What is it about leadership which uh, enables them to to really uh, get excited about being a leader and makes being a leader worthwhile? So what would you describe your lead, uh, leadership passion as? Look, I think um, being a good leader, you need to have good vision and I, or, or be a good visionary. And I think um, certainly... Uh, having the ideas um, and having, I think that the big word there is possibility. Knowing that um, there's something that you want to achieve, knowing that it is possible, even when everyone else thinks it's not, um, certainly um, is a talent um, and, and something that I think leaders, uh, good leaders possess. But then it's also um, being able to consult and, you know, speak with your, uh, you know, your team or your resources or whoever it is that's going to help you achieve that vision um, is very important. I think, you know, trying to figure it out, coming up with the idea and then executing it all yourself isn't generally a good thing for a leader because a leader is good at leading. They might not be good at executing. And I know that from my perspective is I'm a great um, you know, sort of visionary. I, I know that there's certain things. I can see the big picture. I know the, the steps we need to take to get there. But um, I may not necessarily be great when it comes to the execution side of it. And that's where people with the strength to execute are so much better. But generally, those people's skill set, um, you know, generally will not be the people that come up with the big ideas. And they're great, you know, sort of doers, executors. But I think that the leader in any business needs to be the person that um, can come up and create this strategy and the ideas. So when you're looking at uh, possibilities and, and, you know, thinking about where to and what the future can hold and are there any particular models, strategic models that you use, anything like that? Um, not, not a lot. I think there's certainly people that I work with in the business um, whether it's, I think the most important thing that I've recognised is what is this vision or what is this possibility or what is this idea going to actually mean for the business, not just from a, um, whether it's a, it's a marketing or whether it's, you know, is it going to increase our sales? Is it, I've, I've recognised the importance of coming up with things that are going to add to the bottom line and be important for that or is this just a passion project? And I think in any business it's important to have a little bit of both. Um, for me personally, um, having a, a purpose in the business which links back to a charity is, is very important. And although that's something that doesn't add to the bottom line, I think it's definitely been great for us from a, um, a you know a social responsibility aspect. Certainly for me, it's helped you know drive my own purpose in having a business that stands more than just for profit, um, you know, or stands for something outside of only profit. Um, and that's quite a maybe a paradox in financial services or, or when you're dealing with money. But at the same time, um, you know, I think it's it's important to understand. And I haven't got a particular model, but I certainly have people and experts and advisory um, people in my business that I consult with when coming up with these ideas. Okay. So I'm curious about where the the future lies for you. What are your plans? How long's a piece of string? I, it's, um, there's always um, new ideas brewing, um, and there's always, you know, particularly on the back end of a year in financial services where we've had the largest um, royal commission of its kind. Certainly, for for the from the business perspective, really, you know, it's I sort of will have owned classic finance this year for 16 years. Um, and having written the book and doing a lot more in the in the in the speaking space, um, I definitely think the future is going to be education. 
Um, I see the opportunities in our industry um, and the wider community around educating and, you know, having spoken to a lot of consumers and people who've lost a little bit of trust in financial services providers. Um, you know, that I think when you're looking at rebuilding trust, education does play a key part in that. So certainly continuing on our education path of educating not just our clients around finance, but also helping build a stronger industry with people that are looking to come in. So, um, yeah, I think just continuing on that on that path and maybe another book, um, Julian. So we'll see how that goes. I'm, I'm too scared to say it because I'll manifest it and then it has to happen. So, yeah. <laughs> well, well you, you, you know the problem. You've now mentioned it on the podcast, so the listeners are going to be wanting to uh, say, when's this new book coming it, out? It, it. <laughs> Yeah, no, that won't happen. I'm still, I'm still enjoying the thrill of launching the first one just a couple of months ago. So I'd say watch this space, but not, not before the next sort of 12 to 18 months. <laughs> um, but also we're doing a lot in the charity space and raising money um, for the Hunger Project. So only recently we had our annual um, fundraiser. I have an ambitious target, which is out there, um, of trying to raise um, 200000 by the end of 2020 for an impoverished community that I'm supporting in Malawi in Africa um, around microfinance education and mentoring uh, programs to help, um, to help them reach um, self-reliance and, and become um, self-sufficient without the need of handouts from um, other countries. So, yeah. So on the just... Briefly on on the book, why did you decide to go through everything that comes with writing a book? It was, in in all honesty, it was a dream of mine when I was a teenager. I was probably at the age of fourteen, an avid reader. Um, I loved the smell of books. To this day, I still don't. I still buy the old, you know, sort of the print books. I don't download anything on a Kindle or anything like that. Um, and libraries were fantastic places for me to hang out. So the ultimate nerd. Um, and I had this, uh, I always had this dream of, of being an author one day. I didn't know what I would write about or when it would happen or even if it was a possibility. But um, then in sort of late 2017, a couple of things happened for me personally, which got me reflecting on my journey as a business owner um, and as a mentor and as you know, somebody who'd worked with helping people achieve their own financial goals. And I thought to myself, if there was one thing on my bucket list that I haven't yet achieved that I'd like to do in the next 12 months, what would that be? And in looking at that, you know, I'd done a bit of travel already and there was a few other things that I've been fortunate enough to do. Um, and writing a book was still on that list. And I thought, well, Nick just kept screaming at me, when are you going to write this book? Um, and I thought, well, if I don't start now, I'm never going to do it. And there were a couple of things, as I mentioned personally, that sort of um, helped to... I guess, make that, um, you know, goal more uh, achievable in that, you know, following 12 months that were coming. And so I sort of focused and said, yep, I'm committing to this. And off I went again, not realizing <laughs> the journey of, of what writing a book actually involved. And so certainly um, coming out 18 months after that decision was made, um, I've been very, um, very proud of, of what, what I've been able to do with it. So, yeah. Definitely, I think it's it's an addictive thing, and and I, we spoke about this earlier. Is that um, once you've written one, there's certainly a possibility to write more. So we'll see how we go. And, and before we started uh, recording, we're also talking a little bit about uh, both of our passions for mentoring, and you've you've structured your mm -hmm. your business in such a way that you have a, a, a separate party business which does the mentoring and coaching. Why? Why did you decide to invest that heavily into, you know, that building that part of your business about mentoring and coaching? Um, so I, the, the first thing that happened was whilst I mentioned earlier that whilst I was building my business, so I'm, even when I started my first business, I'd had a, you know, I was a, a I'd had a formal tra um, uh, qualification in training and education and I'd worked and done a lot of training and I enjoyed training um, and I can talk with my mouth full of marbles underwater as they say. So being in a, in a, in a classroom environment and being able to articulate and impart knowledge um, is something that I've always enjoyed doing. So whilst I was building the first company, I always had an educational contract role um, on the side that I was doing. That was my passion. 
in addition to what I was doing on a day-to-day basis. Now, around sort of the late 2000s, um, before there was sort of around the time the GFC hit, certainly our industry was going through a shake-up and I was looking at, you know, what it is that I wanted to do. You know, I'd already been in business for almost a decade and I was looking at what the next decade was going to hold. And at the time, the industry was speaking a lot about how are we going to attract new talent? Um, We really need to look at how we can better support people that are coming into our industry because at that time, there was about 65% attrition rate for new entrants that would enter our industry and not make it past the first two to three years, which is very high. And so from a succession planning and, um, you know, industry growth perspective, it wasn't looking very promising. Um, And at the same time, there was also an aging population of of finance brokers who'd been around the industry for many, many years and decades. And, I saw an opportunity to perhaps look at my own business and my own succession plan and I asked myself the question, if I was to, you know, stop doing this tomorrow, what is it that I would do? And, you know, the first thing that came into my mind is very passionate about teaching others and educating. And so that naturally led me to um, look at what it was that the industry wanted. There was some... um, discussions taking place at the time um, with the Mortgage and Finance Association and a couple of other sort of bodies, um, you know, talking about how to attract new talent. And so from those conversations, an opportunity came up for me to start providing um, and facilitating a structured mentoring program. Um, And so I jumped on board with that. um, And then as I started to do more and more of it and seeing the success that we were having with a structured pathway for new entrants, and seeing how much inspiration not only that I was um, giving um, in my nurturing journey of these small business owners and new business owners, but I was also getting quite, you know, inspired myself. And I think that's where mentoring can be quite special is that it's not a one-way street. Um, And so as the business um, started to grow, we were taking on more and more new entrants. Um, And, you know, we wouldn't take on everybody. There was certainly um, an interview process and we needed to make sure that our you know, values aligned, Um, you know, it was going to be a two-year program, so you needed to know that you could work together for two years. And, um, you know, seeing what mentoring has been able to do for me personally has been a huge, huge reward, but also, you know, for me, the biggest reward is watching um, the people that I've mentored really succeed, and and many of them have gone on to win, you know, some significant industry awards, um, seeing how, you know, by having the structured mentoring and having um, the right guidance and support, they've been able to really change their lives and and leave their corporate roles and replace their income within a few years and then build some robust and and sound businesses. And that's massively rewarding for me. And how do you continue your development as a leader? Um, From a different, um, I've been, look, I'm fortunate enough to um, have met some amazing business people along my own journey, but Um, I also um, have some mentoring myself. Um, So I think, you know, you can't be out there um, nourishing others without nourishing yourself as well. And so I've been very fortunate to have access um, to some very, very successful people in my industry as well as externally. Um, I've also been fortunate to have a lot of strong female um, business owners, a lot of, um, you know, people in my industry who've supported that role over the years. And um, I also am part of a structured uh, peer-to-peer mentoring group um, that I catch up with on a monthly basis, who I refer to as my advisory board. So, um, and, you know, we, we bring different strengths and different skill sets. So I'm quite fortunate in that I have various avenues for, for soundboarding, um, you know, challenges and, and helping. Uh, yeah, I've got some individuals in my life that help me with my own growth but also investing in various um, professional development programs as, as we discussed earlier. I'm, I'm noticing a real trend towards small business is uh, really trying to create more of those advisory boards, those peer to peer mentoring relationships. How did you get into that? Mm. Was it something you started, something you were asked to join? Yeah, I was asked. Um, I was, there was an opportunity to join one with a particular network that I'm a part of. And, um, you know, pretty much jumped on with that. I had, a, I had looked at a few before and there, you know, there are so many good ones. I think the most important thing is really deciding what it is that you need. And then 
finding a group that you can um, you feel comfortable with, most importantly, because in those groups you've got to be quite vulnerable, um, not just in you know with you personally, but also you know being able to be comfortable to talk about your business at a macro and a micro level, and sometimes that could involve you know sharing information. Um, because everyone in that group is, is like-minded and they're, they're doing the same. So it's about really showing up. And I think like anything, um, you know, you're going to get out of it what you also put into it and the, um, you know, and the expectation you have of what you're going to get. But it's really important to, I guess, align yourself with a group that um, you feel comfortable with, most importantly. Um, in the group that I'm part of, we um, have a very high level of um, confidentiality, um, you know, to the point where we've signed agreements and and all the rest of it so that we can confidently and comfortably share. Um, so whether it's a formal or an informal um, arrangement, you've just got to determine what's, what's better for you. Uh, I found that having, you know, a proper sort of confidentiality uh, clause, we've had, you know, a code of conduct mm-hmm. and certain things that we, um, that we work with um, has really helped to create the sort of playing field that we're in. But at the same time, um, the, the people that are in my group, I get along really, really well with and we've become very close. And although we're across different industries and different size businesses in terms of revenue or teams, um, you know, the skill set that every one of us brings certainly helps, um, helps us all when we're trying to work together through challenges and, and, and gaining that advice. So are there any leaders that you look up to or that inspire you? Oh, there's a few. Um, I think, um, you know, the, the, and and sometimes, you know, we sort of look at this and think, oh, it's got to be somebody grandiose or, you know, somebody famous and well-known. And much as there are people that I think I look up to um, on that level, um, you know, who I, who I look to for inspiration. I mean, I think, um, you know, Michelle Obama is quite inspiring. I, you know, people like Richard Branson, who I think have um, been amazing in, in what they've been able to build. or um, But also, I think, uh, you know, there are some amazing um, small business owners who I've met who have been just phenomenal in in growing a great team and great culture. I've been fortunate enough to work um, in financial services now for almost two decades and a lot of the clients that I work with are, you know, entrepreneurs and small business owners who do amazing things on a day-to-day basis. So I get a lot of inspiration just watching their own journey or their own resilience or how they've been able to tackle challenges. Um, you know, I look at my mum, who's not even a business owner or a corporate person, but she's a great leader and managed to, you know, keep um, keep us on the straight and narrow. And she's she's led in her own way. So there are, you know, certainly different people that I've looked at um, over the years for inspiration. And um, you know, it's not just one person that I think I want to be like you. It's certainly um, across across the, you know, I think you take from different people what their strengths and what they're very good at and um, look at how that helps you in yourself. Okay. And if people want to find out more about you and the work that you do, where should they go? Yep. So I have a website, nancyyousef.com.au. Um, and there's also um, our classicfinance.com.au website, which is, um, talks a little bit about some of the other work that we do as well. Okay. And any last words on, on leadership? On leadership, I think the most important thing is always to be authentic, approachable and absolutely empathetic to the people that are relying on you um, and are trusting you to help them on their journey as well. Well, on that note, Nancy, thank you so much for being on the Synergen Leadership Podcast. Thank you again for the opportunity. that wraps up episode 99 of the Synergen Leadership Podcast, another great business leader episode for you. I'd like to encourage you to head on over to the Synergen Group website and engage in the conversation with us. Tell us what you liked about the episode, tell us who you'd like us to interview, or tell us what sort of content you'd like us to deliver to. And if you are an iPhone user, please feel free, head on over to the Apple site and leave us a review. Really does help us build awareness of the rating and we really would appreciate it. In next week's episode, we finish Season 2, Episode 100, with an episode about my reflections of the season. We did the same thing for Season 1, and I think it's a great way to finish off Season 2. So until then, love to hear what you think. Happy listening.